Greetings, travelers, and welcome to Traveler RPG Headquarters. You can find our Facebook group by searching our name, Traveler RPG Headquarters, on Facebook. Thank you for participating in our May Day Traveler Day event. It's a day we celebrate Traveler and all its offshoots for all the fun times it's given us. I'm your host, Frank Sucardi, also known on Cyborg Prime, and today I'm happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Mark Miller of Far Future Enterprises. Welcome, Mark. Well, thank you for having me, Frank. Thanks for coming. Um, wow, Traveler is a great, great game, and uh, I just got to say how much I appreciate you coming and uh, doing this little interview for us. Um, tell us a, a little you know, bit. Oh, go on. Mm -hmm. Frank, it's May Day. You know, uh, I keep forgetting to do this every year, and this year I didn't. You know, I like I like May Day, May Day better than than May the 4th, honestly. It's a much better yeah. much yeah. better pun or play on words. And yes, it's perfect for Traveler Day, so great idea. Yeah, and uh, so this year we're doing something about it. That's, that's part of the fun. Fantastic. Well, I hope it carries forward. Uh, hopefully okay. we're starting a new tradition here. <laughs> so, so, Mark, tell us about yourself. Where are you from, and uh, what did you do before you were got into game design? Well, you know, the easy way is to say Google Mark the C. Miller, and everybody will know more than they ever wanted to know about me. But, you know, I was in the Army, and I got out, and I went back to school, and I just kind of fell in with some guys who were doing war games, the old classic SPI, Simulations Publications, Inc., war games. And I was blessed to, to meet up with a, a game club at Illinois State University, and they had this marvelous program. They just said, games are almost impossible to understand unless you have somebody to explain it to you. And they set me up with a geography professor. It was part of their program. They said, you want to play a game? We'll teach you how. Any game. You pick the game. And so I met this professor in his office on campus after hours, and I said, I want to play France 1940. Not a good starter game, but he sat me down. He showed me the map. He showed me the rules. He showed me the counters. He explained very easily, just kind of read the rules to me, and we talked about them and explained all the things that you can understand if somebody explains it to you. We played one turn of France 1940. That's all we could fit in. <laughs> but at the end of that evening... I knew how to play war games. Literally, uh, you know, I was at school. Um, I didn't have a lot of responsibilities. The other game clubs, people did this, didn't have much responsibility either. We would stay in the union, student union all night long and play games. And after a couple of weeks, we started making up our own variations. And it got me started game designing, and I've been doing it ever since. And literally, that's talking about 40 years of it. It's been what my job has been for the last 40 years. Wow, that's that's amazing. And so I'm not familiar with that particular game. Is this like one of those one of the old like Avalon Hill games with its uh, all different kinds of like like Panzer Blitz? Um, yes, we're talking about games that are well before your time. Okay. <laughs> you know, D Day, France, 1940. Um, were these played with miniatures or uh, or cardboard chits? Cardboard chits. Mm -hmm. And that's where most of my games have come from, is from that heritage of cardboard chits. But literally, um, one of our designers, Rich Banner, one of the original partners at Game Designers Workshop, went to the student organization and talked them into a budget for our club of about $100. And for $100, he went to a shop job shop printing company here in town and had them print huge 23 by 28 inch sheets of hex grids so that we could fill them out, out ourselves. We could mark our own maps on them and design our own maps. Um, he printed a thousand of them. I still have about 300 sheets in my garage 
we never used them all. Shows how many a thousand can be. Wow. <laughs> um, but we, I started with Mayday. I, I realized that if you could draw a, an arrow from one hex to another, you could, and uh, you could do vector movement. And we were literally burning a sheet every game we played. But that was my first game, my first published game. But that was the first game I designed. And uh, its movement was carried on into Mayday, of course. But uh, uh, Triplanetary was my first game. And even uh, Steve Jackson Games recently republished it in a new edition. Oh. It made me very proud. That's my first game, and literally it's been reprinted after 40 years. Wow, that's fantastic. And uh, so uh, when, when, when did you publish your first game? 1973. 73. I was only five. <laughs> not only that, but I'm kind of shading the truth when I say 40 years. It's closer. <laughs> hey, that's great. So, so, um, so when, so when did you first become interested in RPG gaming? Like, when was, when, what were your first experiences with like RPGs? Oh, well, you know, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson invented recreational role-playing games, but they've been around before. I call them analog. That um, In the late 60s, I played analog role-playing games in a political science class. In fact, I'm st Lou Gold is was my professor. I, I'm still in contact with him. Huh. But I call it analog because we would research what a senator does or what a, um, a, a lobbyist does, and we would research details of of that background or that case that they had. And then there would be a big session in class where we all assumed those roles and argued our points, and the professor would try and grade us on it. Hmm. But that, you know, that's hard to do. That's educational. That's studying. Right. It's like studying for the, you know, I participated in the model um UN or the Model Organization of American States. Um, recreation doesn't want to have to spend that much time in preparation, or at least not that kind of time in preparation. Right. And so what Arneson and Gygax did is they said, let's make this digital. And uh, instead of all this touchy-feely stuff, we're just going to say, here's a number that's how strong you are, and here's a number that's how smart you are, and here's a number that's how much magic you have. And I was, you know, your role-playing people out there know what this means intuitively. Um, and it took a while for people to actually figure out what it meant to be able to express it. But, you know, the magic of recreational, I call it digital role-playing, is a smart player can play a dumb character or Conversely, a dumb player can play a smart character. And you don't have to be as, even as a, a, a less than bright player, you can have great inspirations if the numbers say you can, because the referee can tell you what they are. Right. Um, so, you know, in the Dungeons and Dragons caught, caught on with, war game people and we were in contact with war game people and they showed us Dungeons and Dragons and we immediately took that copy of the game out and made 10 copies by photocopy mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, while we ordered ones that weren't in weren't in stock at the moment right so then we all got our copies of the wood grain or the white box original D&D &D, and then being responsible people destroyed our photocopies because now we had the real ones it is um, nice to have the original stuff. <laughs> no, we don't have many more. But that... <laughs> so, um, at, at one point, my part, one of my partners, we had started publishing war games. You know, we were publishing real games and groundbreaking games. Uh, Drangnek Osten was the Russian front war game of World War II. And we came out with a monster game that nobody else had thought to put out. Uh, so we had a good reputation, but it was all in historical war games. Hmm. Um, and by this time, we had rented an office upstairs in, down, in uh, downtown Normal, Illinois. 
and we're working all day long and well into the night every day. And Dungeons and Dragons came along, and after about a couple weeks, uh, Frank Chadwick had to say, you're not allowed to play Dungeons and Dragons if the sun's up. <laughs> because we were not getting any work done. We had deadlines to do, we had games to, designs to finish, and nobody wanted to do them. We all wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons. So we shifted our playing time to the night and worked all day anyway. Um, that was our uh, um, our introduction to role playing. Uh, Frank did a a role playing game very quickly called On Guard, um, which is a cute little one booklet game, and its intention was that you generate your characters and play that night for your session of Three Musketeers, and then you start all over fresh next time. Hmm. Uh, and there was no continuity of characters. That's a clever idea. Great for one shots, which in, in today's world would, you know, maybe you should bring that back. <laughs> yeah, I think about it. I think about adapting it to uh, the Imperium. Uh, I had done a, a, another sort of game that was popular at the time. It was never published. It had a working title of Imperium, which I used for something else later, but it was, um, near earth interstellar space opera you know with slower than light travel and took years to get from place to place but it was an economic world building empire building game <clears throat> um, but when we and i had that before dungeons and dragons when we encountered dungeons and dragons i immediately thought we need a science fiction role-playing game like this and i have memories of writing in 1976 the game, the original Little Black Books for Traveler. And if you look closely, you'll see that Dungeons and Dragons has a, uh, um, the first book is what, Men in Combat. So I wondered, well, how am I going to write this game? I opened up the Dungeons and Dragons book and looked at it and said, well, I'll do a book on characters in combat. And I started converting tra Dungeons and Dragons in my own mind to science fiction. It's filled with science fiction ideas. And I had this image that I was going to do a um, kind of a generic, a GURPS kind of do anything with the science fiction situation. Mm -hmm. But I found that very quickly that there are too many possibilities in science fiction. So I had to make up one way of traveling between the stars and one idea of what the interstellar empire is or is there one and pretty soon we started creating the imperium and started creating uh, a consistent background behind it was it kind of like a uh, synergistic like you were, you were building the um the imperium setting and then at the same time going oh we need a way to handle this thing we're talking about let's add that into the game oh exactly you know, and then we were doing what I thought would be fun science fiction. And I was also trying to do something that was understandable to anybody who picked up the game. And so it really couldn't be a system where there were secret parasites running people or um, zombies or anything else. It had to be pretty generic vanilla science fiction. Mm-hmm. And it was, but that's what people wanted because they could turn it into whatever they wanted. When we first started playing with my group, it was uh, kind of aliens, uh, alien themed, you know, uh, humans sure. fighting a uh, alien invader somewhere on the ship or in the, you know, in the facility. Um, but then, uh, man, traveler is so versatile, um, that we, we would see any kind of science fiction thing and go, Hey, let's, let's try that out. In, uh, in our next Traveler game, or let's make that worked into a scenario or something. And, uh, and, and, and it could pretty much fit. Yep. What you needed was the foundation from Traveler of these are what your characters are, these are what their digital abilities are. If you're going to think about something, this is the framework you think about. Somebody's mind works and intelligence works. Um, you know, we added strength and dexterity and endurance. We added education. I wanted social standing, which uh, 
you know, relative hierarchies, those shape things. Mm -hmm. And you look at any science fiction movie, you can pretty much map it to Traveler. You read any science fiction book, you can pretty much map it to Traveler. That's true. That's the truth. So, um, one thing that I've always noticed is that there's a, is that while there may be some, you know, things in Traveler that are not strictly science-based, there is a lot that is science-based. And, um, you know, like calculating how far, how, uh, far your ship can go in a given amount of time and things like that. Um, or, you know, um, even on some of the, um, uh, these might have been down the line in like Mega Traveler where they were coming out with system detail charts and so forth. And it seemed like they did, the, the, the authors, you guys, um, put some thought into you know okay with well, the planets can't be that close to the plant to the star if it's that hot you know or uh things like that and somehow managed to get that into charts and stuff so do you have do you like have a science background where all this stuff comes from where where, where do you come up with these charts what's your well, info I, I sources? Have a sociology background so i don't have any background at all in science but mm. i do respect science um i am a science fiction person rather than a fantasy fiction person mm-hmm you know, I like Lord of the Rings. I like the other fantasy as well, but that's fantasy. Um, and so I've always been just guided by wanting to have some realistic basis for things. Um, I'm, uh, it doesn't mean that I don't enjoy fantasy, and I don't, I, it doesn't mean that I don't think fantasy has a place even in Traveler. Mm -hmm. But the foundation is, is there some foundation for this concept? It's not just... If they're parasites, are, what kind of parasites are they? And you can always look at science somewhere, and it'll tell you something and give you some idea because nature, long before we came along, came up with those ideas. Right. You know, even alien is just, you know, parasitic wasps. Right. Grown large. Um, nature came up with this a long time before the science fiction writers did. So you'd say you know, uh, going to um, nature for inspiration is a good idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or just the world around you, why reinvent the wheel? Well, yeah. Then that, you know, even the idea of adventures, why reinvent the wheel? There's Somebody has written a story about this sort of thing somewhere. Mm -hmm. But then again, they haven't. Right. You know, I remember science fiction. I have a classic, I call it a classic science fiction education. I've read most of the science fiction from 1950. 1975 or 80. Okay. I've read it beyond that, but I know that stuff there. And there are these classic science fiction stories. There's one where, you know, these science fiction, these science explorers are doing something. They come to a strange world. They land on it, and it's got kind of a, a, a metal shell. And then they find a door, and they open it up, and they find that it's entirely artificial inside, you know, mechanical and it's just a short story and it's just saying oh look we found this look at the majesty of the universe of all the things they are but there was no one there and they don't know what's going on and they go on again and they go on because they can't stay well my players of course would immediately saw a piece of that metal off to take it away mm -hmm. and they would look around and they would take souvenirs and all kinds of stuff and it would have grand repercussions you talking well, rendezvous they, with rama no, this is a different one. It's just a short story. Okay. I wish I could... But, you know, this is what, uh, you know, role-playing is different than science fiction. Science fiction stories are trying to tell us themes and plots and such. Role-playing is, what would you do? Well, if you come across this thing, you're going to loot it and check the bodies for the money and all kinds of stuff that real people don't do or real situations don't have, but role-playing loves to do. Right. Um, and it's all about money and value and things. Um, and that's a basic foundation of role playing. That's what people. That's... But I've also discovered. I've also discovered that that after you've played a while, it gets old. You've got enough money. Here's a story that I have. I was playing travel with my grandson. Mm -hmm. Eight. How um, awesome is that? <laughs> yeah. And it's fun, you know, and he just wants to play it all the time. And so I'd kind of give him an assignment and send him off to do something by himself. And he would he'd draw a picture of his Barger character named Coots, and he would, um, you know, 
I'd, get, I'd give him a drawing and then he would color it in and all that. And he had all this, this page of notes on this character that he created. I don't know how he created it because it wasn't by the rules, but he had his own spaceship and he had a billion credits. And eight years old, he recently encountered the word billion. So he knew how <laughs> much the billion was. And then we, so then we were adventuring and he, you know, goes somewhere and does something. And he stopped and he bought lunch. And he told him it cost him 22 credits. And so he laboriously subtracted 22 from a billion. <laughs> and he now had 900, 9 million, 999 million, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it's very gratifying as a grandfather to see your grandson using the techniques of the world. He understands he has to know how much money he has. He understands that there's value spent and then you have less. He knew all those things. It's fun. It, 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 this, this kind of swelling of pride of seeing him getting it about living a real life. So That's fantastic. Yeah. That's, um, that's one of those uh, opportunities that a uh, traveler gives you um, through playing, you know, learning how to track your money and, and when you have lots of money, then what else is there in life? You know, uh, well, there is yeah, more to life than money, you know, and, and you and then, can find that out you, through gaming. <laughs> no, and you come to the next point that is once you have enough money, you start being concerned about power. You know, all of a sudden you, you don't you don't just need a, a money. You want to have a ship or mm -hmm. a barony or right, a, yes, or a castle or whatever it is that you want to do, and you start doing things with that. Um. I'm, there's this universal cycle that then once the character has enough power, he doesn't care about power. He ha once you have power, you don't care enough about for most of them. And they start wanting to know the secrets of the universe. And they really get into, you know, going to find out what this threat is in the universe and what the, the reasoning is behind it and resolving that. So there's various levels. There's something for everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, one of the, part of the staying power of the game, I think. So, yeah. um, so what, what you said you had uh, you read a bunch of sci-fi. Which what sci-fi authors or titles most influence you uh, when it comes to putting together Traveler? Um, well, first of all, when I was in college, I commuted to uh, into Chicago from the suburbs, and so every day after class, I would walk through a pretty seedy part of town in Chicago to get to the train station and stop in this bodega, which for some reason had a carton of cover stripped analog for astounding science fiction magazines. I wager that it was a complete set from 1948 to 1962. I don't know why it was there, and I certainly don't know why they were selling them for, you know, 25 cents a copy. I'd buy one, pay my 25 cents, read it on the way home on the hour of commute to the suburbs, and then throw it away. But at the end of that day, I had read another month worth of science fiction. That was fun. That was an, that was an education. I read everything at one of the, from one of the major science fiction magazines. And so I was familiar in general with what was going on in science fiction. I also read the other stuff. And so, you know, Asimov is my prototype for an interstellar empire. You notice that the original interstellar empire for Traveler is pretty much all human. Mm -hmm. uh, just like Asimov's, you know. Asimov was, you know, the idea of a, a think about it, the idea of a, of a monolithic human empire is pretty crazy given what we know about the universe. But mm -hmm. I have to say, I had not fully figured out how to handle aliens when I started doing power. So Asimov's foundation is a great inspiration to me. Um, Niven's work, the charted uh, known space, is, was a wonderful inspiration. Good scientific-based stuff. I really liked B.C. Tubbs' Doomerist series. Talk about just 
science fantasy space opera. This this better than average human hero wandering from world to world in a in a um, more or less human empire. It just seemed to go on forever. There really wasn't even an empire. It was just uh, all concentrating on individual worlds. I, that, w- that was an inspiration to me. I thought that Traveler ought to have that, where you could just generate the next wo- go to the next world and you generate it on the spot. There you are. Figure out what these numbers mean, which inspires me again, because this whole numbering system comes from... Uh, Doc Smith's Lensman series. Mm -hmm. He loved having uh, a string of numbers that would define a starship or a string of numbers that would define something or or, or a a Sophon species. And I tried to emulate that. I've been relatively successful, I think. Uh, With the the extended hexadecimal? (laughs) uh, That, and, you know, I was talking to somebody, one one of my designers the other day and he said you know the universal personality profile really has legs you give somebody a string of six numbers and they can pretty much puzzle out if this guy is smart or dumb strong or weak you know socially powerful or lower class easily out of just six little numbers even Dungeons and Dragons has trouble telling you that much information without having a whole character sheet. So, <clears throat> so Foundation, um, Larry Niven's universe, um, Doomerist, and Doc Smith. That's a great eclectic mix of science fiction. <laughs> so, um, I haven't read Doomerist. I, I haven't even heard of it. I'll, I'm going to have to look into that. I've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, people talking about it around on the on the bulletin boards and the uh, and the Facebook groups when you when they when they all. refer to Traveler, especially. You don't need to read them all. Just read a couple of the early ones, and you get a real feel for what he does. So, what was the first science fiction movie you remember watching and then wanting to watch again? Oh my! Uh, well, I can remember The Fly. That was good. The original fly. The original fly. Mm-hmm. The original blob. Also good. Blood rust. Who ever heard of that? I haven't heard of that one. I remember seeing that at the drive-in, and it was basically this thing that turned people to, I don't know, zombies or killed them or made their blood dry up or something like that. You know, an alien menace. And how are we going to deal with things? Um, I remember science fiction movies from before they were good, you know. Mm-hmm. Star Wars is the example of the good science fiction movie, and it spawned a bunch of bad science fiction movies. But science fiction is a lot better today because of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So um, so we talked about how you were inspired to create Traveler, a science fiction game based on your experience, how, how much you enjoyed playing D&D. Um, how would you come up with the name of Traveler? Was it just obvious, or did you guys, uh, did you come up with a couple of other working titles and, you know, try some different things before you settled on Traveler? I settled on the name fairly quickly, and I think I'm inspired by uh, Doomrest. The Doomrest uh, EC Tub is a, 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 you wouldn't like it if I called him a British writer. He's an Irish writer. (laughs) Uh, uh, But he was a, 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 you know, British-English expression um, and the whole idea of who Doomrest is, is this wandering traveler in search of lost earth um, I wanted I very specifically did not want this to be space traveler or star epic or something like that because I wanted to set ourselves apart the first thing to do if you're going to set yourself apart is not call it space or star something mm-hmm Good point. But the double L comes from the Britishism language that I was familiar with from Doomerus. Mm. And so um, it, it set us apart. Uh, you, had, you, you had me duped for many, many years. I thought you were British. Aha, uh-huh. yeah, good. <laughs> um, 
when when we first came up, when we first announced the title, and we just announced the title, first we're a war game company. At the time, Game Designers Workshop specialized in war games. Um, it had some science fiction game, but they're all board games. And so we announced the title Traveler. And Richard Berg, who's the big, one of the big designers at SBI, thought we were doing a game on the American Civil War. Because Robert E. Lee's horse's name is Traveler. Mm. So, and it would, that, that'd be a great name for a role playing game, World War, or American Civil War, but it wasn't. Hmm. Um, we've been, you know, I've, we've carried the double L through in all kinds of things. And whenever I can find a chance to spell a word with double L, I do. <laughs> well, we're talking about strange spelling. What's with air slash raft? Oh, that just I made that up. I, that's also one of the things from the Bluegrass series. You know, I don't know what they, but needed some word for it. I think it's it as was. good as any. And um, uh, yeah. I remember reading someplace in, um, when I first, was first trying to, uh, considering making supplements to Traveler, there was like a, a canon and it's like, you must always spell Traveler with two L's and Air Raft must always have a slash. <laughs> right, right. That's what it was. <laughs> But that's what I tell people. It's it's like, you know, it's a grab thing, so it is kind of like a raft, and it flies through the air, so there you go. Yeah. What would and you call it, you know? <laughs> you know, the original Traveler, the original Three Little Black Books were filled with making your imagination fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time describing what an air raft did, and so you had to come up with it yourself. So when you, um, so when you were, um, First doing this, it sounds like you had some partners that you that you worked with in the early days. Um, Game Designers Workshop was a partnership of Frank Chadwick, Rich Banner, myself, and Lauren Wiseman. Um, we all had worked in a game design project at Illinois State University doing educational simulations, but we really wanted to do recreational. We wanted to do commercial, fun games. Um, and there wasn't a lot of market for the war games that, with the, the hex grid maps and the cardboard counters that we wanted to do. So we went into you know, a, a commercial project, selling these things by mail to whoever we could find, eventually getting into distribution. Um, so these three partners, we all just did what we wanted to. We were doing war games. And uh, we would have a weekly meeting and somebody would say, I'm going to do this game. You know, they would do uh, the next one in our Europa series of World War II, so we'd be Narvik. And the next one in our, uh, just a historical war game, Frank wanted to do the Battle of Torgau, so we did that. I looked around and I did... Um, Coral Sea, a naval war game, because I wanted to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, one day I said, I want to do a science fiction role-playing game. And they said, sure, okay, you go ahead, because that's how we did things. So each person would just take the lead on their pet on their own pet project and then call in help from the other guys in their specialties if they needed them? Or... Exactly right. Mm -hmm. You would show text to people, and they would say, what about this? Or they would. You say, oh, that looks good, or whatever it was. So um, everybody did pretty much what they wanted to do. And these were all guys that you met um, in college? or um, were, That's right. We all met as part of the War Game Club at Illinois State University. So what was the hardest part about creating uh, the first uh, Little Black Books? I mean, what was the hard, like the whole process from beginning to end, like from coming up with it to like outlining it to play testing it? What was the, what was the most difficult part about creating that first edition of Traveler. You know, people talk about playtesting and Game Designers Workshop was famous for not playtesting its games. And that's not right. We playtested, we just didn't traditionally playtest because you can't really design a, a multi-hour board game and then have people play it and learn it and get expert at it so they can give us back on what it needs to be done. Instead, we would sit down with a couple of people and explain the rules to them or have them read some of the rules through, and they would 
play a couple of turns. And you could see what worked and what didn't. And we all developed some good expertise at being able to extrapolate those particular experiences to make the game better. Um, I think it was a, it, it's a, a hard skill to develop, but if you do, we found that we could pick up any game, pretty much scan the rules and come to some conclusions about how playable it was and how easily the rules would work and often find problems in the rules that this published game had, it was clear that they had. So um, our biggest problem was play testing. It was coming up with a concept, showing it to a couple other people in the office, and they would uh, give good feedback. And then we would, I would, because I wrote it all, I would then adjust it, maybe show them what I'd changed, maybe not. Um, and it shows in the original three little black books. You know, we published the three black books in 1977 at um, Origins Game Fair in Staten Island, New York. July 22nd, that's another one of Traveler's Birthdays. Mm. Um, <clears throat> we uh, uh, literally, we sold, we were used to selling a couple thousand print run of a war game over the course of 18 months, 18 months to two years. We sold 10,000 copies of the Little Black Books in under a year. So we knew we had something on our hands that was working. Well. Um, but the original books gave you one skill for a term of four years and another skill if you got promoted or commissioned. And so by the time we, we, we revised that edition three years later in 81, and uh, we went to a skill a year, more or less. So you got four skills for a term, plus a little bit more, but started at 18, so there was room to catch up. Were you trying to model that we, after, like, college or something? or? Um... We, well, we, it just that people wanted more skills rather than less. Mm -hmm. and, um, more skills gave people more abilities to do things. But we... Uh, that was something that we didn't catch in the original edition, that people would want more skills than we were giving them. Where did you come um, up with the idea for, of going through careers and terms and stuff like how, uh, I, I, well, probably from your military career, but, um, you know, <laughs> who came up with the idea of being able to be dead during uh, um, character creation and due to oh, bad yeah, circumstances in your life? Well, my father was a naval officer. I was aware of his career in his life and his post-naval career in civilian life. Um, I had just finished three years in the Army, so I was aware I had that feeling, you know. I, and so I saw everything in terms of enlistments, in terms of service. Um, one of the testing things that we had, and I, you know, we did when we play tested, one of the things we discovered is that if you left people to their own advices, devices, they wanted more rather than less. And so everybody was a six term admiral with a lot of skills and a lot of experience and a lot of money. Um, there had to be something to keep them from going that far, but you can't really tell them you can't go that far. So, we made it possible for them to be dead. <laughs> That's something that can happen when you join the military. And after a while, there's a natural thing. You know, people make these decisions. Am I going to keep going? Am I going to... Um, this is a great character. Do I want to not have him? I'm going to quit after three terms, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it worked. It, it, it... The other thing is that no one had done any real put any thought into the underlying systems in role-playing, that they were intuitive. And 
Dungeons and Dragons has levels. You start at 18 and you work your way up. Um, it makes sense if you're going to have a bunch of, you know, a first level wizard and a first level fighter and a first level cleric, and you're going to go out and adventure and you're all equal and you're all going to kind of develop as you go. Um, but Gary and, and Dave Arneson did not spend a lot of time thinking that through as a process. They just made it up and it made sense for what they were going to do. And so I looked at that and I thought it didn't work for a modern technological society um, because you can't go off in a spaceship with everybody being 18. Somebody has to be mature to be the captain. And nobody wanted to play through 16 years of character development before they could get a ship. So we had to move forward with a non-level based uh, prior career experience system to let somebody be more experienced and able to be a captain and more likely to have a ship. Hmm. Uh, so in a sense, it's just intuitive. Now we can see that all role playing breaks into two, in this sense, breaks into two halves. One is the level based system and one is a non level based prior career system. So hmm. that was a great idea. And uh, it's one of the, one of the mini games, if you will, uh, present in Traveler that people really appreciate and spend a lot of time doing. Oh, and, and it was fun. People love, you know, when I first showed the structure um, for generating characters, the game people in the office, they all enjoyed generating characters. So I thought, we well, seem to have something that works. It's good. It's great. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent doing that. <laughs> so, um, well, that gets us to the end of our first segment. So let me just stop for a little uh, uh, station identification, travelers. <laughs> Welcome. This is uh, Traveler RPG Headquarters. You can find our Facebook group by searching our name on Facebook, Traveler RPG Headquarters. I'm your host, Frank Zuccardi, also known as Cyborg Prime. And today I'm talking with Mr. Mark Miller of Far Future Enterprises. Welcome back, Mark. Um, let's talk about the present now. Um, what what types of games do you like to play now? Like if you if you didn't have Traveler in your life, uh, what kind of game? What other games would you do? You like board games? Do you like card games? Which ones? Um, my goodness. Of course, my life is dominated by role playing games, and I, Traveler. I, I literally play Traveler all the time, at least with myself, the way everybody else does. <laughs> where I generate situations, where I make things up. My life is dominated by that, and I really enjoy it. I'm blessed to be able to do that. I'm influenced by other role-playing games. I rarely play them. Um, I, as I said, the, the alumni of Game Designers Workshop developed a skill at looking at things and understanding them uh, I really like Cthulhu. Uh, I stole the idea of sanity from them. I think that Sandy Peterson's, I think it was Sandy Peterson, institution of sanity just added a new dimension to everything. Uh -huh. And, you know, I like that. I like paranoia. Um, it, it, its theme of, you know, paranoia. Is a lot of fun, right? The expendable characters. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you just you're, you're kind of this meta character because you're not going to survive, right? Uh, <laughs> I like that's role playing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll pick up role playing games time to time and just kind of scan them to see what they're doing, um, because I like that. I like to see what other people. Are uh, um, when uh, when people come over who have never played a, a role playing game before, um, do you try to teach them how to play, or do you just uh, say, "Hey, it's game night. Let's play Monopoly," or uh, or you know, let's play uh, I don't know cards or whatever? Okay, I like to play Bananagrams. Bananagrams. <laughs> Bananagram. It's it's a bunch of Scrabble tiles on a table mm -hmm. in a uh, 
banana shaped pouch and uh, 144 tiles of a variety of uh, letters. And you build words just like Scrabble. Huh. Except I'm building my words here with the 21 pieces I have. And my wife is building her words over there. And when you run out of pieces, you take more and you say split. Each of us has to take one. And whoever can complete using it all their words, all their letters, and all the letters are exhausted first wins. Right, if you didn't make any words that aren't real, you know. Oh, uh, it's fun. It takes maybe twenty minutes to play a game, and it's fun. It does sound fun. It's a challenge, you know. And um, I, uh, my family plays games. They like to play games, board games, new ones, mm -hmm. and they introduce me to them from time to time. Um, we're a family of game, not only game players, but game designers. I'll put a plug in for one called Unrivaled. Um, kind of like a truth or dare game. Okay. But uh, Google that. And uh, my daughter and her daughter, so my granddaughter, designed that together. And it's out. You can find it at Barnes & Noble, I think. <laughs> That's great, man. What a great yeah, tradition I to pass down through your family. Yes, yes. Yeah, you must be proud. I was going to say, you know, there's so many traditions of, tra uh, so many editions of Traveler. You know, you got your classic, you got Mega Traveler, New Era, um, Traveler 4, Traveler 5 GURPS. Uh, I guess there's Traveler Hero. Although I, I pride myself in collecting hero stuff, and I just found out about Traveler Hero <laughs> researching for this interview. Um, yes. But, uh, man, there's so many flavors, and now you have offshoots like uh, Cepheus Engine. Um, and everybody's got their own. Everybody that plays it has their own flavor that they're kind of loyal to. Like, you know, I'll always be a classic guy or, you know, running running my um, Facebook group, I have, I've had people go, you know, oh, well, if it's not a classic, then I don't want to be over there or whatever, you know. And uh, so people are really, like, loyal to the game and they really, really love it. So what I wanted to ask you was, like, how does this, like, long live over 40 years of, like, this game going and this broad, you know, success? How does it make you feel? And to see, and to see your, um, you know, new kids being brought into this and your family members kind of carrying on the tradition. You know, Traveler is good, clean fun. Um, and that's what makes me proud, that I see people enjoying it and you know, they can, they can go out and and indulge their fantasies of science fiction. They can be part of a world. It's, you know, I get testimonials from people who say that Traveler is what taught me how vector vectors work, or how to use algebra, or I was a terrible student that didn't care, and Traveler is what got me interested in math. Um, I. You know, I'm, I'm aware that these are people who are motivated and something was going to motivate them and catch their interest and transport them into success in their lives. But I feel good that it was Traveler that they picked to do it with. I like that. That's, that's a nice sentiment. Um, I'll, I'll tell you another story here sure. for a minute. Sure, go ahead. That um, in the 30s, Coca-Cola was the cola drink, and it was everywhere, and there was no rival to it. And then in the Depression, you know, in the economic issues of the 30s, Pepsi-Cola came along. Coca-Cola was eight ounces, and Pepsi-Cola came along, and... I'm sure you think you can tell the difference between Pepsi and Coke, but I'm not sure you can <laughs> if I don't show you the labels, you know? Uh -huh. um, Pepsi-Cola came along with a 16-ounce bottle for a nickel. And I think there were a lot of people at a time when a nickel and a dime were vastly different prices, and especially if you got twice as much. And we have two big colas today, Pepsi and Coke, because Pepsi stepped in with a different choice for people. Now, where I'm going is, if Coke had come out with near Coke for a nickel, 
and 16 ounces, we would never have heard of Pepsi. And Coke would run everything in the cola industry. I'm of the opinion that just because burps is different from my rules on how you play Trapper doesn't mean that we can't make that universe available to GURPS players. There are GURPS players who won't play any other system, and that's why we did GURPS Traveler. There are hero players who really want to play hero rules, and we were open to having Traveler them. That's why we have so many different Traveler rule sets, but they're all about the Traveler. Yeah, I, I have quite a few of them myself, and, and the traveler heart or spirit of the game, I think, has been maintained and carried over to these other, um, uh, these other, what do you call it, like, uh, systems. Um, and, and you can go, I, you know, like, I'll open, um, Traveler 20, and I go, yeah, this is Traveler just made into Roll 20. I mean, made into um, D20. And uh, I think it was uh, successful. And for people who love D20 and will only play D20, uh, I think you're right. Um, there, If you don't put your product into the D20 market, then it's not going to be there. Right. And, uh, and, and those people who would have been exposed to it and enjoyed it and developed it um, would not exist. That's right. So you see my point. That's a good point. But the other point is that you talk to people who won't play anything but classic, you know, mm-hmm. as you say. You know, when I started the Traveler 5th Edition project, it's been almost more than 20 years ago, I took Traveler 4th Edition, and I thought I started by saying, there's a Rada in the 4th Edition, and I want to fix it. And as I played with it, I came... I was really addressing all of the things of classic traveler that needed to be addressed. And I wanted to make one big book, kind of like Donald Duck's nephew's junior woodchuck man, all of the rules you could possibly have in one central forum volume. And so I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. Ten years ago, I came out with Bruce draft, playable, call it a beta, um, and tried to do everything that I wished I'd done in classic. I tried to address everything. It naturally was going to be more complex than the others, but it really is the intellectual descendant of classic traveler. But the first classic traveler was written over the course of less than a year, and it was very rudimentary. It didn't know how to handle aliens. Didn't know how to handle um, uh, androids or robots or synthetic clone. Mm-hmm. It didn't know. It did not have a developed task system. It only resolved conflict with guns. You couldn't argue. There were no rules for arguing with somebody or convincing somebody or persuading them. Um, it did not have a good way of, it could build spaceships, but it didn't have a good way of building vehicles or generating your own guns or uh, designing your own things. Uh, All of those things were natural offshoots, which we tried to do in Classic Traveler, and that's why Classic Traveler is just like 47 little black books. Traveler 5 is trying to put all of those 47 little black books and more into one book. And of course, I'm going to put a plug here because this is May Day and we're dealing with a Kickstarter to produce the three big black books, original little black books grown large to 280 page, to 300 page volumes, in a, which does all that. Um, but it is the intellectual and uh, conceptual descendant of the little black books and classic traveler looks like a great project and um when when you um uh when you're explaining travel to somebody can you can you recommend a short list of movies or tv shows that a person can watch to get a feel for traveler i mean i've heard rumors that um that uh, joss whedon based uh, serenity and firefly on uh, his games of traveler 
Um, but maybe, I don't know if you're aware of other, <laughs> other movies or famous things that were, but, um, is there a, anything that pops into to, mind? I need, to, I need to recruit somebody to come with me with their phone and video when I confront Joss Whedon at Comic-Con and say, so tell me about your travel campaign, Joss, you know, <laughs> just get him on record because he's as close to on record as he can be to say that Serenity and Firefly are his travel campaign. And anybody with half a brain can see that they are. Mm -hmm. so, um, One uh, show that kind of uh, makes me think of Travelers, uh, the old uh, British TV show, Blake Seven. You know, all of those things, even Doctor Who, you know, is possible. Um, I think what what connects it for me is is it reminds me of the artwork of the uh, uh, traveler world, um, you know, with the kind of canteen packs on a belt, you know, utility belt and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. things you know, like that. Uh, the, uh, what do I recommend? You know, there's the tri I consider it the tripod of science fiction systems. There's Star Trek, there's Star Wars, and there's Traveler. <laughs> Star Trek is this kind of a clean, um, idealistic science fiction future. Um, and it's all about people. It really is. It's instead of science fiction, you know, it is science fiction, but it's about people and their decisions. Star Wars is kind of this huge, sprawling empire. Um, and that's the other extreme of what people want. Traveler, of course, lets you do anything. If I had, you know, I could produce Star Wars edition, and the rules would just map one-to-one -one with Star Wars. Um, and it would give you something that you wouldn't have in the Star Wars plane, which is you could turn left instead of right when you come to this corner and go invest, investigate some part of the Star Wars universe that nobody ever sees. Mm -hmm. And you would never see the Rebellion. You would never see the um, the Empire. You would just be somewhere else. That's back to the roots of what Traveler was trying to do. You can make Traveler into anything you want. Is there a, a movie or TV show that comes to mind that when you uh, see it, it makes you think, wow, that was totally Traveler? Well, you know, well, Star Wars was. Mm -hmm. We literally finished writing Traveler um, the end of June, end of May in 1977. And Star Wars was making its world debut in June. And so with my partner, Lauren Wiseman, we piled in the car and drove normal 120 miles north to the Chicago area to see a Star Wars movie, you know, and sat down not knowing what to expect. And wow, we were, you know, everybody has their memory of Star Wars, seeing the first Star Wars, but we were mapping it in our minds to how we had written for travel. And it, uh, oh, we can do that. Look, here's jump space. Here's, you know, here's these characters. Here's this blaster. All of these things that we just were figuring out, how we were going to handle them in our in in the rules we had just finished and sent to the printer. So, you know, in in terms of in our minds how this works, Star Wars, somebody made up Star Wars and it mapped perfectly to Traveler. That's um, awesome. <laughs> on the other hand, Trinity and Firefly, you know, those things are mapped from Traveler to what this guy did. Right. Uh, as the movies so right right so uh, people should keep that in mind with the chicken and the egg um which came first traveler um <laughs> so uh do you ever go to um gaming expos and conferences now you mentioned earlier that uh, you were kind of back on the uh, conference circuit i backed out of them for a while and i've gone started going back to them at least the ones nearby what's your favorite so I would Harrycon in uh, Lake Geneva in the spring. Mm -hmm. And I go to Alex Kammer's Game Hole Con in Madison in the fall. Um, 
those are the two that I tend to go to. Do you run games at these conventions? I do. I do two kinds of games. One is it's a role-playing scenario. And basically, I um, haul out a deck plan of a starship, and everybody generates characters and sits around on the And then just show, okay, so here we are. Here's this starship. You found it, and it's lying derelict in an asteroid. And they set about exploring it. And I don't know what's in there myself. I just kind of take their lead. Some of them mm -hmm. think of it as alien, and so they're afraid of alien monsters. Others think, I'll bet there's a payroll in the safe, you know, and they want to heist it. Mm -hmm. And the players don't know that you're picking that their brain. Picking <laughs> the story themselves. <laughs> right. So it's, it's, okay, so what do you want to do? I'm going to try and open this airlock. Well, what's your strength? Six. You're rolling in six, and you can't get it open, you know? So you're going to have to try something else, mm -hmm. you know? I wonder if there's a payroll in this safe. Well, let's try this number. And they roll, and there isn't. And so then they go on. Mm -hmm. uh, every scenario plays out different. Every scenario, I'm sometimes amazed with. But it's it's almost like a Ouija board because they're the ones who are coming up with what they're going to do. <laughs> that's a that's a good uh, uh, comparison. So it sounds like yeah. well, I was going to ask you, would you or do you rather be a GM or player? But it sounds like you'd rather be the GM. I like playing. I like telling people what they're doing. And I like <laughs> seeing what they're doing, enjoying their responses. They don't have to know how to play because I can tell them what they need to know. The other thing I do at these conventions is, is I run Can You Survive Traveler Generation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, prize to the person who lasts the longest? Well, or just Can You Survive at All? <laughs> you know, they quit before they die mostly, but. They, there's probably one or two out of three characters dies, you know, so, but it's bragging rights because people like to go home with a, I generated a character <laughs> at, in Traveler at this convention and he's dead. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. So in the Traveler novel, which I finally wrote after years of wanting to, called Agent of the Imperium. I've heard about and it. it yeah, well, you should read it. And we've got a, an audio book. We have, um, we have a, we have a physical copy. You can get that. You can do a download as an e. -book. We have an audio book where it literally has an ebook on the disc as well, mm. and it has a PDF with like three hundred footnotes explaining all the secrets of the story. But it's it's the story of this guy who is dead. And they recorded his personality, and they bring him, they implant it in a host, and it lasts about 30 days. Um, and during that time, he is the agent of the Imperium, and he's doing, you know, massive projects that need to be done. He has great authority. But at the end of that 30 days, the personality fades from the host. The host returns to control his own body, and this agent... His name is Jonathan Bland. You know, is dead again. And so I have a, a a fantasy sequence where he is in the Dakaseri. It's never clear if this is real or not. Is it just a dead mind or whatever? And so it's not clear. But the Dakaseri is the legendary audience of stars where all who were ever ever lived and all who ever will live sit in a vast audience up in the sky and watch what goes down on goes on down on the world um, and it's fantasy mm -hmm. you know it's a dream sequence sure some people don't like it but it's fascinating to think about it and it's a way of doing commentary on what's going on in the story um, sounds really interesting I, yeah it, it's I have this idea of doing an adventure for dead characters. <laughs> I if like that. A character, and if he lives, okay, we're going to play. But if he dies, then he is a character you can use in this exploration of this vast 
stadium we call you know people sit in rows and watch what their children and their grandchildren are doing or their descendants mm-hmm. or um, and uh it'd be fun to explore what's up there and how it works that's a really original concept i like that i've never, I've never heard of that before and uh, i like it mm-hmm. it's a good uh, i like it as as good as any for like an afterlife or like you know kind of explanation yeah and is it real or is it a fantasy i don't know mm-hmm. I don't know myself. I haven't come to that conclusion. <laughs> so anyway, so on this Kickstarter, we're doing one of the one of these parts of it, in addition to the three book slipcase set. And we're doing a um, an adventure set, a PDF. It's a download uh-huh. called "The Voyages of the Free Trader." Insert name here, and. Uh, it's basically this free trader going from world to world. And it, there's five different adventures as they find the lost idol of the Amindi, or they rescue the space princess or whatever those stories are. Mm-hmm, right. But the meta adventure is they their ship has just gotten out of annual refit and is, they don't notice, but when they get to the next world, they discover that its name has been changed from whatever it was, you know, the Beowulf or the Aesir or the Dane or whatever, to insert name here. Somebody reset the transponder and didn't enter the name of the ship in. And (laughs) And customs officials understand and they really understand that, but they're still going to inspect, inspect the place from top to bottom because there's something wrong. And this is, in addition to the adventures they're having, um, on each world as they visit it, they have a meta meta adventure of trying to get their transponder reset to actually tell people that they are the wolf fame instead of the insert name here. Right. Yeah, that sounds interesting. No, that's another. And of course, the, the idea is for the adventures is they are each one is an example of some part of how the travel rules work, oh. whether it's world exploration or ship combat or personal combat or persuasion, whatever those things are. We're trying to give examples of how each works. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. And then people can try it out and see and, like you say, have a um, a primer on how to do the thing. Right. So, exactly t- right. so tell us more about these uh, big black books. I, I was doing some research on them, and it looks like uh, are there going to be three of them, and are they are they going to be like modeled after the original set of you know with characters and combat and so forth, or how how are you going to lay that out? Well, when we did Traveler Five several years ago, it's one big black book at six hundred and fifty pages. Mm-hmm. It, yes, <laughs> it's unwieldy, you know. And so, in addition, as we worked on fixing errata and making things work better, you know, incorporating feedback from people who've been playing it. Um, I broke it into the natural division. Book one, characters and combat, which is characters and personal combat. And some of the other stuff that it needed, like tasks, skill, those things. Book two is starships. Book three is worlds and adventures. And each one then fits into a more manageable 280 to 300 pages. And the three of them together in a slipcase. Um, I'll, t- I'll say that I think that the weakest parts of the previous system were personal combat and space combat. And I think we've conquered those issues. Just, I want to talk about space combat here for a minute. Sure, go ahead, yeah. Space combat is, is has always been, okay, you shoot at a ship and you damage and all that sort of stuff. And before, it's been rather impersonal. Um now it's this system of, okay, we're going to attack, you know, this space combat is happening. We have ranges, we have rolling range dice um, based. And the, the weapon is one part of it. It determines part of the number you're trying to roll. The other part is the skill of the gunner. So together, the weapon and the skill of the gunner help determine what your role is to hit. Okay. It does a certain amount of dice damage, which uh, 
will or won't penetrate in uh, the armor, or it'll wear some of the armor down, and the next hit will penetrate. Um, but instead of it saying, and this is the part that I think is great for point, instead of it saying, you destroyed that turret, or you destroyed the engines, or whatever, it puts them out of action. And they, after the battle is over, we can inspect it and evaluate it and find out that the drives are shredded or not, based on some evaluation and diagnosis later. But <clears throat> during the battle, we don't know that. I call it Schroding. Like Schrodinger's cat. Right. Know? Schrodinger's uh, damage. <laughs> Yeah, Schrodinger's damage, you know. <laughs> we don't know if it's dead or not. Um, and maybe damage control will make it not be shredded. So somebody can, a, a, a player, a character on that ship can step forward and attempt damage control and look, I fixed it. <laughs> um, and it can be brought back to action. So there are roles. We have roles for each of the characters, the, the pilot, the gunner, the damage control guy, the medic who's going to do the same thing for people who are injured. You know, it may look terrible, it's covered with blood. Oh, look, it's only a scratch. There's something for the players to do during combat. It's not a, an impersonal um, sh attack and damage system. Um, it's more, it, it's very much like the bridge of, of, of the enterprise. That everybody has their job to do, and if they do it right, we can make things come out okay on the other side. I was going to say, it sounds a little bit more frenetic, like how the bridge is on the, you know, yeah. on the enterprise, where everybody's but doing something and pitching in and helping each other. You know, the this guy passes the targeting information from the scanners to the gunner and the gunner, you know, passes that to the targeting computer or whatever, you know, and, uh, and through teamwork. Um, and that's another great thing about travelers. Uh, I notice in my players, they're always doing teamwork stuff. You know, I'm going to, um, modify this thing with my mechanic skill and then you program it. <clears throat> you know what I mean? And I know exactly uh, what you mean. And that's, you know, the, that's the other part of travel, and of course, that's the part of role playing is that it's not about me being better than you. It's about us together being better than if we weren't together. Mm -hmm. um, and some people don't ever make that transition in playing to understand what that's about. But the good role players do. So tell me what are some of the goodies people can get from your different kickstart levels. I saw some prizes listed there. Um, well, um, go on. Well, at the lowest, you know, I want to start out by saying that we're we're doing a PDF download, you know, of all three books. It's a massive download. It's almost 800 pages worth of stuff. Um, we've added 100 and some pages to head book. Um, as PDFs, they're really great, and we want people to support us, to back us at Kickstarter for that. But if you've already backed us before and have the PDFs. We're, they're available through drive through And when we finalize them, August, you'll get that download automatically if you had it before. The upgrade it comes to, so you don't have to back us. We want you to back us anyway, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, some people don't like the downloads. They like to have a physical thing. We have a CD-ROM I call that the fourth officer level. You know, we have we have call it fourth officer, third officer, first officer. Along there, you can, uh, at, at like first officer, I think it is, you get the three books, hardcovers, in a slipcase, plus the CD-ROM. Um, and uh, the next level up, you get all that, plus I call the benefits deck. We've been playing with playing cards for the last couple of years with a card which shows what a starburst for extreme hair looks like, with a card that shows what an advanced combat rifle looks like. They're, you know, they're not 
comprehensive descriptions of the thing. They're a picture and a prompt, um, but they really work well on the gaming table as an indication of something somebody has and uh, a prompt for them to use it. So we have a deck of cards at one, at one of the levels. It's a benefit card, which will have 12 weapons, 12 worlds, 12 ships, and some other things, some metals. And, um, you know, one of the things that Traveler has in the Trask system is called an arcane task. Um, the example in the book is it's called an arcane task that somewhere you will learn how to do something that nobody else really knows how to do. You're a really good engineer and you can tune your jump drive so you always come out precisely at 168 hours instead of plus or minus 10%. Okay. Um, and we have a card for that task so that you as the game master can give that to somebody when they've earned it and now they know how to do it. That's like an or achievement. You mm -hmm. always hit the first shot. May not later, but the first shot. You always hit at, you know, extreme range or beyond or below. Um, arcane tasks. They're just fun things that are hard to put in the rules, but are fun to have on the table. I like that. That's um, a good idea. Thank you. The other thing we're doing is oh, I labeled these these reward levels at fourth officer, third officer, whatever. And I, I'm making a card I randomly generated like a hundred starship a hundred free traders and their crew. And so if you're a fourth if you support at the fourth officer level, we'll give you a crew member fourth officer. Um, and you know, and it's got fourth officer is usually, you know, the steward. Mm -hmm. So have the appropriate skills for that, whatever. Um, third officer will give you a third officer, which is usually a medic. And a fourth officer. Ah. So, you know, if you support at the captain level, we'll give you a full crew of captain, first, second, third, and fourth officers. Hey, that's cool. It's a nice little pre-generated. And at that level, we'll also edit your name into the card rather than... Oh, wow, cool. Super cool. We'll actually put your Frank name into it. Hey, that's cool. And... That's a just nice thing to yeah, those are that. Well, those are some good ideas. Um, so, uh, how do uh, how do we find this listing, and how, how do uh, how do we help uh, back this project? Well, thanks. I hope you will. Um, uh, Trevor Five on uh, Kickstarter. It's, uh, just searching is going to find it. It's easier than me giving you a. Uh, we just search for Traveler 5 and it'll go Traveler to the 5 Kickstarter. Will find it. It'll be an active thing, the three big black books. Okay. I'll put some things on Facebook as well. I'm going to put some emails out to people. I think you can Google traveler5.net slash kickstarter.html and I'll have a page which has like a, an information sheet and a link. Trying to make it easy, as easy as I can for. Cool, and uh, if uh, if I get that role, I will go ahead and post it at Travel RPG headquarters and help funnel people that direction. Are there uh, other ways to find out what Mark Miller is up to? Do you have a website or a blog? Um, I don't have a blog. There is something called Citizens of the Imperium. There's a lot of stuff about Traveler. It's a bullet board discussion board. A lot of people are on that. You look up Citizens of the Imperium and you'll find it. Um, I'm actually on the board and it's pretty active. It is. Mm -hmm. kind of people were talking about it. You know, we have an, I, I want to talk about some things here. We have sure. <clears throat> Citizens of the Imperium is this wonderful uh, uh, bullet board, discussion board. We have um, <clears throat> TravelerMap.com. Traveler with two L's. Travelermap.com is this wonderful map of the Traveler universe. That thing is awesome. It is awesome. And it is awesomer than you think because you can make your own stuff. You can map your own stuff that you put together. It'll do that mapping. It shows all the way to the center of the galaxy. Um, it's just incredible. There's a little link. If you pick any world and click on it, 
the data comes up in the left-hand corner, and there's a place you can go to Traveler World where it will map the world for you. In fact, it, it has uh, the ability to insert your own random and it'll map the world again for you differently. So anytime you need a world, it'll make one for you. You can add your own. It'll, it'll map a world you made up. Is this something that uh, is fan-made, that somebody just made? Fan-made. Jonathan Sherlock in Australia does it. You know, and it's amazing the the the, the amount, amazing. yeah the the amount of support material and third party material and things that just people made up and put out there on websites for you know making characters and searching you know deck plans every there's so much uh, content uh, for traveler it's it's just mind boggling you know talk about resources that anybody who wants to do an adventure on a world can get a world in the course of a couple of minutes and print it out and it works um, and it works consistent with the traveler five rules um i i know that i i came across a typographical error you know it, I, I created a world i looked at it and i saw that the key spelled wasteland waste space lowercase l land and it shouldn't say it that way. You know, and I sent a, popped an email off to the guy, Jonathan Sherlock, and he said, I'll fix it in the next build, he said. So people are always doing that. Oh, so, and Traveler Map has things, there's a thing called experiments. We have the wave, which is going to crash through charted space, you know, in, in the next couple centuries. And it, there's a place to map where the wave is that drives crazy right now or at any point in the history of the Imperium. Mm. Uh, great stuff. There are plenty of Easter eggs in there that are just incredible. Wow, I didn't know about that. Hmm. Well, that brings us up on to our last segment, um, which is going to be the future of Traveler. So let me just do another station ID here. Greetings, Travelers, and welcome back to Traveler RPG Headquarters. You can find our Facebook group by searching our name on Facebook, Traveler RPG Headquarters. I'm your host, Frank Zuccardi. I'm called Cyborg Prime out on the <coughs> internet, and today we're talking with Mr. Mark Miller, the creator of Traveler, and uh, thanks a lot, Mark, for sitting here with us, and uh, uh, this is, uh, I know I told you I'm gushing a little bit, but really, to me, you're a celebrity. <laughs> um, yeah, I've... Uh, enjoyed your products for so long and and got a lot of enjoyment out of them. So I just want to thank you. Um, well, Frank, Frank, I appreciate hearing that. I want to say something back to you because you are typical of or representative of just about the best hobby in the world. I mean, role-playing is good, clean, fun. I started in role-playing new, you know, I came in like, a year after it was invented, I've seen it develop that we've gone through hard times where they thought it was devil worship or right. bad stuff or whatever. You know, the pastor's kids play Star Wars role-playing in the basement of the church today, and nobody thinks a thing of it. They still won't play dungeon, play Dungeons and Dragons, right. but, but that's devil worship. But they'll play role-playing. Right. Um, that... When we started, it was us going to conventions and playing scenarios with people. Today, I, when I play a scenario with people, chances are I will have a father and his daughter playing in my game. That we see parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren coming to these conventions, sharing this interest with each other with them. The next generation and having good, clean fun. Now, I think that a lot of pursuits in America today or in the world that, that don't match up to what role-playing does as a recreation. And I'm blessed to be in this business. i got to say, role-playing games kept me and my friends out of trouble. Uh, it, where I live is in a rural area, and there's plenty of mischief to get up to. And yeah. uh, rather than do that, 
we spent our times uh, traversing the universe in uh, uh, you know in a, a game in that we played completely in our in our imagination and that all thanks to you um, so you've had this you know really long career in game design and, and you've seen like you know the the whole length and breadth of gaming industry of the role-playing game industry at least from from its roots until now and you've seen like uh new mechanics being developed and things that you didn't have when you first um when you first started publishing traveler so what kind of advice would you give to people who are just starting in this industry boy you're just asking me the prompts that you know the, the other thing is that you can actually design you can do something in this industry and get good feedback on it you can do a role-playing scenario and the conventions are very happy to have you sign up and run them for random people at a convention that you go to. Um, if you come up with good ideas, or what you think are good ideas, you can get it published. You can sell it at the a, a dealer room at any convention you go to. There are local people who are selling their scenarios or their own ideas playing game and it's a fun way you can spread that around and share it with others that's great advice there's something for me, any and a lot of industries the cost of getting into it is prohibitive you know there's no place for you really can't get anywhere in writing science fiction or romance novels unless you want to make it your career but as an avocation, uh, kind of a, a thing you like to do, gaming is the place where you can do it. So if you could uh, retire to any system in the original travel universe, where would it be and why? I want to be the emperor. The emperor. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Your uh, <laughs> celestial palace is, awaits. Yep, that's me. <laughs> Uh, so, what are your? You have any short-term plans uh, personally going forward? Absolutely, you know, but I'm not going to stop until I die. Good, that's good to hear. <laughs> so, so uh, this this physical reprinting of the books in this format is the immediate thing I'm working on. Um, I want to write another traveler. Agent of the Imperium was, uh, you know, very satisfying to write and very well received and and uh, and a very interesting look at the traveler universe. I have another novel which I'm in the middle of plotting, which I hope to have out by the end of the year. You know, the fun thing about the traveler novels is that I get to show you a view of the empire or universe that role playing games don't let you describe. So it really is showing you how what I think the what the universe is going on, doing, and how it works. Right. So, uh, so like have, uh, aside from your plans of, of your books, do you have any expansions or, or uh, additional um, gaming stuff planned? Oh, absolutely. Do you have plans for Traveler Six? Um, I don't have plans for Traveler Traveler Eight. Traveler Eight. What is it for eight year olds? Oh. <laughs> But, you know, one of the things is that, that, that role-playing is set for kids 12 and up. And eight-year-olds are a different kind of kid. They really, there's a different kind of activity there. And, and working with my grandchildren, you know, I came up with some ideas. And now that I'm here, I would like to do, you know, a, an activity kit role-playing game. You know, that you could play with your eight year old grandchild with one hand tied behind your back. You know how to play. You know how to do things. You know how to make things work. But, and, and I'll tell you, one of the things that I want to do in Traveler 8 for eight year olds is encourage the game master to have a theme. You know, that you want to influence the lives of your grandchildren and you want to teach them and your children as well. And some of you are have 
children who are eight years old. And they want to play role playing. They want to play this game that you play. So you can play it with them and you do the scenario, you do the situation, and you don't have to tell them what you're doing. But there can be a theme of. Or you're teaching them virtues honesty, along the way. Honesty or lying, mm -hmm. or kindness or generosity. You know, and when they aren't generous, they don't get much back. And when they are generous, it comes back tenfold. You know, you can do those things. And those conversations, frankly, will last their lifetime. And you can never sit that child down and say, let me talk and tell you about the consequences and how you really need to be true. But in a game situation, you can make those lessons and they will understand them with such depth that they will last them a life. And that's what I want to do. Right now, there I'll tell you, there is not a product on day that is a traditional role-playing market aimed at eight-year-olds. And I would like to do that. But I, I, I like that I, idea. Um, I talked about space combat. I really want miniatures set space combat game um, Mayday. You know, people like the spaceships, and I would love to have some starships of the classic ones, like the Beowulf and the Scout lab ship and whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the game rules, you know, I, I it would be more of a game than it is the uh, Travel 5 rules at the moment. But um, there are some great enhancements that could make that a lot of fun. Well, these are all great products, and I've uh, enjoyed everything that you've ever produced. Um, I've I've got I've followed uh, every edition of um, Traveler from Classic Traveler, except for the Hero Traveler, which I just found out about. But um, oh, I've always that too, so that's okay. <laughs> I try to always stay up on it um, because yeah, Classic is cool, and you know it gets a lot of people in. That's what I started on. But there's been so many new mechanics and things that have been developed that that have been integrated along the way into the game that have just made it that much more playable and awesome. And, um, and you, you know, you're right. That, that, that literally the original Traveler was roll high, you know, but Traveler is, has transitioned to Traveler 5 to roll low because if you want to roll high for a characteristic, you know, the whole Thacko system is trying in Dungeons and Dragons is trying to address Rolling high and having higher, I, don't, I can't explain it, but you know what I Yeah, they had to flip, they had to to flip the thing. Yeah. If you're going to roll a high characteristic, then to be successful, you have to roll under that characteristic. That means you're trying to roll low, roll high for things, and roll low for actions. Right. Right. Well, I think that's been all worked out. <laughs> all right. Okay, thank you to me today well thank you so much that's the end of our show um i'm your host frank sicardi called cyborg prime i'm the uh admin behind um traveler rpg headquarters which is just a fan-based uh traveler and sci-fi uh group on facebook and uh if people are looking for us just search for traveler rpg headquarters uh, i've been talking with mr mark miller of far future enterprises who's been kind enough to be our keynote speaker for our first uh, uh mayday mayday traveler day event um mark thank you so much for participating in the mayday event and um, one more time give us your contact info so we can find your product line so you want to look at uh, farfuture.net Great. Uh, that's a good place to look at. And traveler5.net. Fantastic. All right, then. Well, that's all for now, all right. travelers. Thank you, Mark. Until next time, happy traveling.